minute or so. So we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and begin. Um, I'd like to uh, first apologize to everybody for the uh, inconvenience of of the technological issue we had, and uh, we appreciate your patience. And um, but we're here, and nobody's hurt, <laughs> so that's good. The benefit is we're also recording this, so you, you will have access to this. Or those who you might know who were unable to attend or were frustrated by that uh, hiccup in the beginning, they'll they'll have access to because we'll e email this event to them. So um, I'd like to just introduce myself. My name is Mike Pru. I'm a professor of history um, at the University of North Georgia on the Dahlonega campus. Um, my areas of specialty are the ancient Mediterranean world, Roman history, uh, fourth, fifth century in particular. Um, and so today's speaker um, uh, has a lot of relevance for me personally uh, and professionally in uh, the things that she's going to talk about. But I just want to give you a little a, a quick introduction. And we're our, because of our late start, uh, we're just going to our timeline, of course, shifts shifts down. And I uh, just uh, I just wanted to let everybody know that. Uh, with Zoom, uh, you can, uh, uh, what we're going to do here is uh, Diana's going to speak for 20, 30 minutes, and then Bill and I will then do kind of interview style interaction with her uh, for probably 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll open it up to the group. And when we open it up to everybody, we'll, we'll be able to see your faces if you want to reveal your faces. And the way you'll communicate with us, or I should say with uh, Diana, will be through the chat or the raised hand icon. Um, and for those of you who are unfamiliar with the raised hand icon, um, if you move your cursor to the lower portion of the screen, a little menu bar will pop up and you'll see mute, stop video, you mention your audio participants. Um, share screen and you'll see that yellow hand raising up like that and you can click that and then our moderator IT person will release you to make your verbal comment um, or you can engage the chat function off to the right and I'll be monitoring that. There's also a closed caption uh, uh, tool in Zoom also if you uh, are on that cursor uh, that menu bar you, uh, it's the last icon, you click on that and it's uh, show, a little menu will pop up, show, show subtitle, and you can uh, read along um, if you so need to, okay? So just uh, a couple of things there. So um, Mountaintop Lectures formed um, as a book club in 2007 um, to discuss the meanings and dimensions of religion, experience, and identity. And in 2010, they formally came together to host some of the most eminent authors in the field. Um, past speakers include Marcus Borg, Amy Jill Levine, Robin Myers, Bart Ehrman, Brian McLaren, Cynthia uh, Bourgeau, uh, John Dominic Croissant, um, Bishop John Shelby, Rabbi uh, Rami Shapiro, Peter Enns. I mean, that's like half the list. <laughs> so um, a, a real treasure trove of insight and wisdom there. Um, in 2016, Mountaintop Lectures formed the partnership with UNG, this current partnership that we enjoy, to bring these thought-provoking and challenging lectures and discussions to the campusing community beyond. Um, the lecture themes have expanded to explore uh, more complexities of experience where religion, science, and society intersect. And today, we're happy to present our spring 2021 lecture. Um, but to, and the person who will do that, I'd like to introduce, um, who will introduce our speaker. I wanna pass it off to Bill Sailing, who is a founding member of the Mountaintop Lecture Series group and its past chair and board of directors. So Bill, please take it well, away. Well, thank you very much, Michael. That was a, a real good summary of where we've been and uh, we look forward to where we're going to go. Uh, we're particularly delighted to have uh, Dr. Diana Butler Bass here with us this morning. Uh, she's an award-winning author, a popular speaker, an inspiring preacher, and one of America's most trusted commentators on religion and uh, contemporary spirituality. Uh, Diana holds a doctorate in religious studies from Duke University and is the author of 11 books. 
Uh, she has received numerous awards for her publications and has uh, been a voice examining trends in religion and how those trends are likely to impact the practice of Christianity in the 21st century. Diana has, in fact, been to the Mountaintop Lectures before, and uh, we are delighted again to welcome her uh, to this venue. So good morning, Diana, and we look forward to your uh, comments. Good morning, Bill. Um, I'm coming to you all from my backyard office. Uh, some of you might subscribe to my newsletter called The Cottage, and this is it. This is actually The Cottage. It sits in anything but a mountaintop. It's uh, just a very kind of wooded, hilly part of the suburbs of Virginia, but I'm glad to be here, glad to be well, and glad that you are with me this morning. My hope this morning is to share from my new book. It's called Freeing Jesus, and it has a 19th century-like subtitle. I always have to read it myself. The subtitle is Rediscovering Jesus as Friend, Teacher, Savior, Lord, Way, and Presence. And just um, thinking about that list of people who have been at Mountaintop over the years, uh, I, I know that questions about Jesus and questions about history and questions about belief have been front and center in your community. And they, they are for, for me as well. And, and um, you know, for years, I've really struggled as much as anybody has with, you know, what do, what do you do about Jesus? Um, Jesus is this enormously compelling figure is that, uh, you know, people, it's 2000 years after he, he lived and died. And yet uh, we still talk about Jesus as if he's walking around on the earth uh, today. And that's really interesting. There are not that many people in history whose name is as widely known. And especially a person who lived a long time ago who was poor from a very marginal part of the world um, who did not hold any kind of political office, who wasn't a general in a war. I mean, if you think about why it is we remember Jesus all these years later, um, it's a pretty stunning, uh, it's, it's just a pretty stunning thing. And people continue in this long conversation of these last uh, two millennia about who this person was, uh, what he really did, and why that should matter at all um, in our world today. So, so completely compelling as a figure, uh, but also confounding. And uh, confounding in that America, uh, this, is, this is something I think is, is, is true very deeply. Jesus is confounding, first of all, because that person who lived 2000 years ago got wrapped in a lot of other stuff, um, creeds, uh, theological statements, um, specific kinds of approved theologies that the church liked. And so the church itself globally over many, many centuries wrapped that uh, first century peasant in all kinds of interpretations of who that person was. Uh, but then second of all, most of the people in this conversation, uh, we live in the United States. And as I could see when people were coming in and saying where you're from, the vast majority of people who are listening this morning live in the American South. And uh, that means there's um, not just creedal material or theological material that's been wrapped around Jesus, but there is a cultural package of Jesus that we live with throughout the United States, but is very dominant um, in the Southern States. And that is this idea that you know, Jesus came to save us from our sins and take us to, take us to heaven. It's a very simple story, uh, but in the South, it's wrapped in revivalism. It's wrapped around this idea that we're all terrible sinners, that we have to encounter Jesus through some sort of revival or personal experience and then have what people refer to as a born again experience, say a sinner's prayer. And if you do all that stuff, uh, then you're going to be freed from your sins, at least um, somewhat freed, uh, and you'll be, you'll be able to go to heaven with Jesus. And so there's the, the creedal Jesus, 
And then there's the, also the cultural Jesus. And so compelling, yes, but confounding because it's hard for any of us to try to figure out about all of the, the packaging, you know, what to do um, with, with Jesus. And so those questions are behind this project, freeing Jesus. You know, what are we freeing Jesus from? I think we're freeing Jesus from those accretions, accretions that we have inherited um, from the past. And in my case, at least in the story that I tell, I'm also needing to free Jesus from some of my own misapprehensions along the way of who Jesus was in my own life. So let me talk a little bit about that process and then explain some of the book. And then Bill and Mike and I are going to get into deeper conversation about some specifics of this project. Uh, 125 years ago, there was a German scholar who saw these same problems. And he wrote an essay. And in that essay, he said that we had to understand that there was the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. And his name was Collar. And uh, Professor Collar said that the, the task uh, for uh, biblical studies and theology was to make this clear, you know, who was the Christ, the Jesus of history, who was that peasant who walked around the earth um, 2000 years ago, and who is the, the Christ of faith. Now, people at Mountaintop, you, you all get this because you've had enormous number of lecturers over the years who have been experts and really wonderful lecturers and teachers, great, uh, great books uh, they've written on this issue of the Jesus of history. And so Marcus Borg, uh, Bishop John Shelby Spong, Dom Crossan, Amy Jill Levine, they're very much interested in the Jesus of history to go back beyond the accretions and look at both the history of the Bible, it's biblical interpretation itself, um, and also to look at the sort of the histor historical and cultural contexts around the Bible in order to unpack who Jesus really was. And if you're anything like me, you love that work. I, I have been so benefited by the scholarship of those great, great thinkers. And several of them along the way, I am lucky enough to be able now to call friends. And every single time I either have a conversation with them or I'm fortunate enough to be invited to speak somewhere with them, I literally sit on the side of the stage and I listen to the person who's at the podium and I learn things constantly um, from those those great scholars and you know we're also sorry that uh, Bishop Spong um, is out of commission and uh, you know living living with a, a, the effects of a stroke and uh, that Marcus Borg has uh, gone to be in union with uh, with the Jesus he loved to study so much so we have that body of material you're also probably familiar, and I know that when I look through the list of speakers, you've had far uh, fewer speakers who have been interested in the question of the Christ of faith. And those questions are usually more distinctly questions about um, creedal developments. And I think about, for example, Roberta Bondi's work. Um, she, she wrote about this same problem functionally you know she wrote about you know there's this jesus of history but she as a scholar of early christianity she was interested in sort of the earliest packaging of christianity the the desert father and mother's traditions what the early church taught you've had some people like that who have been very interested in the how the faith part um developed especially in the first few centuries um, after Jesus lived. And so, so not only would you have somebody like uh, Roberta talking about the piety and spirituality of early Christianity, but I'm, I'm well aware that there'll be people here who know all about Constantine and the shaping of the creeds and how those early events in the history of Christianity um, changed 
uh, the course of the way we think about the Jesus of history and how that Jesus emerged as the Christ of faith. So, so the questions of Jesus of history and Christ of faith have been well explored um, over this last century. And yet they've left us in a little bit of a problem. And um, the problem is that because we're human beings, what has happened is we've tended to take sides. We've seen the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith, not so much as um, a, a, a reality that needs to be integrated or a, or a way of trying to weave together the disparate strands of Christianity as we've seen it as a kind of a fight uh, between two different groups of Christian interpretation. And so you have the Jesus of history people versus the Christ of faith uh, people. And, and part of the reason I know this is from my own experience. Um, the mountaintop crowd uh, tends to, to be, you know, sort of my age, maybe um, a, a little bit uh, generationally just a, a, a older than me, not much. I'm 62. So uh, I'm a sort of end of the line baby boomer, as they say. Um, but um, I, so I don't know how many of you are on Twitter, for example, as a sort of regular thing. But in the summer of 2019, I was on Twitter and I was just uh, talking to friends. And one of the friends happens to be another writer by the name of Car Carol How Howard Merritt. And Cal Carol, who is a Presbyterian minister, um, had expressed her appreciation uh, for Paul Tillich's uh, view of the resurrection. Uh, that the, the res resurrection is essentially an act of faith. It's one of the dynamics of, of Christian faith. And she said in a series of, excuse me, a series of tweets that she was really glad to be a liberal Presbyterian because you don't necessarily have to believe in a bodily resurrection, but you can believe that resurrection is a metaphor, resurrection is a spiritual reality. And then she went on and she gave out a couple of these Tillich quotes. Well, I saw that and I came in and I appreciated what Carol had to say because I thought she was right. And before I knew it, both of us were being attacked on Twitter by a whole bunch of people who were surprisingly um, within mainline churches. And um, all of them were saying, that no, 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 you can't have these views. These are contrary to Carol's ordination vows. She should be um, you know, taken, taken out of the clergy. Um, I don't know what they call that. It's not disbarred. You can tell that I'm not a, a minister, um, but uh, sh she shouldn't be clergy anymore. And literally people started talking about how they wanted to cancel me and not buy my books because I was dangerous as a theological thinker. And Carol and I were, were just sitting in our offices chatting to one another about essentially this thing, the, the Jesus of history, who we both know a lot about, but then also ruminating on how do you appropriate the faith tradition of Christ um, in terms of the resurrection. And so here we were in the middle of what became a storm. It actually had thousands and thousands of followers on Twitter. It got called Resurrection Gate. Um, and there are people who are still angry at both of us uh, for raising these questions online and calling us dangerous heretics. So people take sides and they, they took sides 125 years ago, and they still take sides today. Um, I've wondered about those sides. I've wondered if we didn't go a little astray in allowing a sort of a single frame, the Christ of history and the Christ of, or the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith, if we allow that frame to carry too much freight and because we live in a divided world, uh, it be has become almost like, well, I'm a Democrat or I'm a progressive and I'm a Republican or I'm a credo conservative and that never the two shall meet. 
And that whole episode in 2000, summer of 2019 was happening when I was in the very first stages of writing this book. And so that episode winds up having a big influence on the approach that I take here. I realized that I wanted to walk past the argument. Not because I think that the sides are particularly wrong. Um, I think that, that both have really interesting things to say and both are necessary in some senses for a, a holistic picture of the Christian tradition. But I thought about my own experience when I was being attacked, this was the thing that was so strange, is I thought about my own experience of who Jesus is. And I realized that I had literally known the name of Jesus my entire life. That means that long before I ever heard about any argument between the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith, Jesus just was. Jesus was there in some sense in my, my consciousness, in my world, um, in the language of the people around me. Uh, I was born and raised a uh, Methodist, and um, I lived in Baltimore City uh, the first uh, 12 years of my life. My family was a family that came to Maryland in the 1660s. And it wasn't until my parents moved in uh, 1972 that anybody uh, in my family uh, left the state of Maryland. And so our history, my family's history is very tied up in that northern edge of the South. And it's also very tied up in the history of Methodism. Uh, Maryland is referred to as uh, the cradle of Methodism. And so, so here I was, this little girl born in 1959, um, in this Methodist world, surrounded by Jesus. And that becomes the template for what I wind up exploring in this book. I was thinking about not the Jesus that I met through my friendship with Marcus Borg or through the classes I took in seminary about the historical Jesus. And I certainly was not thinking about Jesus through all the creeds that I started to learn through confirmation and recite, uh, uh, since I'm an Episcopalian, they show up, I recite them every Sunday in church. Um, before all of that, there just was Jesus. And I realized that my primary window into who Jesus is, is experience, not historical scholarship and not creedal affirmation, but simply the experience of growing up in a world that is inhabited uh, by Christianity. And thus began this project to look at who the Jesus of experience has been in my own life. The way that I actually proceeded with this is really twofold. And um, this is something I think that I'm, I can be an invitation uh, to others. And that is, I literally sat down with uh, six or seven, I can't remember exactly how many pieces of paper it was in front of me, uh, pieces of paper in front of me. And I wrote at the top of the, pa the page, um, age under five. So before, before I started kindergarten. And then the next thing was, you know, six to 13, basically elementary school. And the next paper had at the top adolescence, uh, 14, 15, 16 years old, and then uh, high school. And then finally, you know, college, early twenties and, and, the, and so forth. So I had the, my life, I sort of divided my life up into these distinctive phases on these pieces of paper. And I was then asked myself the question, what is my primary memory of Jesus that I can write down on each one of these pages? And um, for the first 
page of being under five years old, I remembered something. I remembered um, sitting in a Sunday school classroom. I was maybe three, perhaps four years old. It was in the basement of the Methodist church I went to in Baltimore. And I remember that the walls were painted uh, green. Uh, the green color on the walls was uh, paint that the United Methodist Church had gotten as army surplus paint after World War II. The very distinctive color green, I think the United Methodist Church painted the entire denomination with that army surplus paint after World War II. But that was my Sunday school classroom was that green color. And we were sitting there uh, on the floor and our Sunday school teacher, Miss Jean was sitting in a little teeny tiny chair and she was telling us a story about how Jesus called all the little children uh, to be with him. And she held up a picture. And the picture was of Jesus surrounded by children. And there in that picture, there was a little girl with blonde hair and blue eyes. Not exactly what you would find in Israel 2000 years ago, all those little blonde hair, blue eyed girls. But nevertheless, she was there. And I looked at that picture and I saw myself and I went, oh my gosh that's me. And I immediately saw what she was doing. And that is she was very close to Jesus and her head was leaning right towards his shoulder. And that is one of my various for very first memories of Jesus was identifying with a, with a picture that my preschool Sunday school teacher held up while telling us how Jesus loved the little children. And so that's what I did for each one of these pieces of paper is I tried to recapture some dominant memory, something that stood out above all others in that particular time frame of how I thought about Jesus. And those six pieces of paper um, become the names in the subtitle become the themes, the way I thought about Jesus in these six different periods of my life. And so that little girl in the, the picture of Jesus, um, the, what I realized from that moment um, is that Jesus was my friend. And that was my first ever image of Jesus. As, as I went through, then elementary school became Jesus is my teacher. Um, I encountered um, as an adolescent the idea of Jesus as a savior. Uh, college was marked by an absolutely idealistic sort of over-the-top devotion that I developed to Jesus being my Lord. Um, in chapter five, which is a part of my life that roughly takes place in seminary and graduate school, it's about how I I understood that Jesus was my, was the way, but the, how I got on a wrong way and needed to turn around and come back. And then finally, uh, that in my more recent experience, Jesus is a presence. And so a much more kind of mystical uh, sort of reality of Jesus in that last chapter. Now, those that's part of the narrative and getting to Jesus of experience is looking at my own experience and saying, how did Jesus show up in each one of these uh, time frames of my own life? And what does that teach me theologically about who Jesus is? Um, when I tell that story and I think about my own experience, what I know is the case, there are 138 of you here, is that if you laid six pieces of paper down in front of you, um, you might have some similar pieces of paper to mine, um, but you might have ra rather different ones too. In the last week, I've done an enormous number of podcasts with uh, young men who were mostly in their 30s. And uh, almost all of those podcasters grew up in Southern Baptist uh, Convention or other evangelical type churches. And they have no memory at all of Jesus as friend or teacher. And instead, they have very, um, really almost painful and tragic memories of the first way that they ever encountered Jesus was as judge or some fearsome um, idea of, of Jesus. And, and so it's created some really interesting conversations 
uh, literally some of these podcasters cannot imagine a world where a, a little girl would grow up thinking Jesus was her friend and not someone who wanted to condemn her to hell. And so it starts unpacking conversations with our friends that we didn't know we could have. So that, so that's the first sort of body of experience that goes into this exploration for me in freeing Jesus. But then there's the second body of experience. And that is looking at the scripture itself experientially. Um, I don't remember when I first heard that it was a perfectly historically appropriate way to understand the text of both the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament as records of the experiences of people of God through time. Um, it may have been, I think it was probably in graduate school in Duke, at Duke in the, the late 1980s. Uh, but certainly over the years, uh, that's become the primary way that I understand the Bible. So when I go to preach or when I go and do Bible study, what I know that I'm reading is I'm reading a collection of literary documents. I'm reading a collection of uh, documents that are historically situated. I'm reading a collection of, of things that you know, have a lot of wisdom. I have, I'm reading a collection of documents that have, that raise a lot of interesting questions uh, morally and ethically, but I'm also reading a, a set of documents that are primarily uh, reflective of people engaging in the life of community around the God of Israel. And then when you get into the New Testament, it's a communities of people who are engaging the questions about Jesus and um, Jesus teaching and the, the work of Jesus and what Jesus means uh, for their own lives and, and the world. And so that idea of the Bible as a collection of experiences um, has been something I've carried around for a long time, but it never really occurred to me to think about those experiences as the primary sort of window into the life of Jesus until I was working on this project about experience, uh, Jesus, the Jesus of experience. And so I went back to some fairly familiar territory and I went back to one of the authors of the New Testament, and that is Paul. I looked again at the story in the book of Acts about how Paul has um, an experience, uh, something that some of your previous uh, presenters uh, have written about and probably even taught about at Mountaintop. And it's, it's an amazing experience. You know, Paul is a very, very, very zealous uh, person in his faith. And um, he is also very upset that there's this sort of sectarian kind of upstart form of Judaism that's upsetting the apple cart and making things very uncomfortable for other Jews like him. And so Paul refers, who is then Saul, refers to himself as you know, a persecutor of, of people who are following, uh, following Jesus. So he's going into Damascus because he's uh, actually kind of on a mission uh, to go and uh, suss out uh, some of these uh, Jesus traders that are in Damascus. And while he's on the road to Damascus to, to go and try to wipe out whatever this, this young community is in Damascus of, of Jesus followers, uh, he's struck on the road by a light. And uh, there he is, you know, laying on the road and he can't really see. And, and what happens, I think is absolutely fascinating is that he hears a voice and he responds by saying, who are you, Lord? And that question, when I read it this, this time, when I was working on this book, it just kind of blew me out of the water because if I was thinking to myself, if I was struck sort of by a light and laying in the middle of a road and couldn't see, um, I think my first question would be, what happened? <laughs> or or um, how am I going to get out of this? I would have thought of questions that were related to how bad things were for me. 
Um, but the question that's recorded in the book of Acts, which I think is an interesting question for the writer of Acts to give to Paul at this moment is, who are you? You know, and that means that Paul's story, this encounter with God uh, that is through this vision of Jesus begins with a relational question not about what has happened or how am I going to get out of this? But instead it starts with, with who, who are you? And I then went and started looking at the epistles, the ones that we know, you know, the authentic Paul, Romans, Galatians, first Thessalonians, first, second Corinthians, Philippians. I looked at the authentic Pauline corpus. And what's really fascinating from that is that Paul never gets away from the question, who are you, Jesus? Each one of those letters, even when Paul is addressing some aspect of conflict that's going on in one of these churches that he's he's founded paul is also asking this question it's always underneath the surface and sometimes it pops up as an overt question of who are you who are you lord who are you jesus and what um is obvious I, and i write it at the very beginning of the book and i'll just read you a little of this um each letter struggles with Paul's very first question, who are you, as he contends with faith, personal travails, and the conflicts in the little churches he founded. Through the letters, we do not meet a single Jesus. Rather, Paul introduces us to many Jesuses, gift-giving Savior, egalitarian radical, wisdom of God, merciful one, light of the world, joy of all hearts, mystical insight, deliverer of sin and guilt, and cosmic vision. From the ver his very en first encounter on the Damascus Road, along the paths of his missionary journeys to his own imprisonment and execution, Paul met Jesus over and over and over again. And Jesus was always new. Paul's first question intrigues me. He asked, who are you? Not what are you doing or why are you talking to me? Who is a relational question? A question that opens us up toward companionship, friendship, and perhaps even love. It is the question we try to answer whenever we meet someone new. If we find out who is sitting across from us, we might know how to proceed with whatever comes next. To know who is an invitation into a relationship that can, if we let it, change us and often send our lives onto a completely unexpected path. That's the Jesus of experience. It's the Jesus on my six pages, friend, teacher, savior, Lord, way, and presence. And it's the Jesus when we open the New Testament. Christians in sort of my universe always love saying, oh, but Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. As if we'd never have to ask that question, who? Um, uh, over and again. But the, the problem with just sort of quoting that verse, using it as a clobber verse, as it were, to stop a conversation about Jesus, oh, Jesus is always the same, is that we are not. Uh, we as human beings live within time, that we experience the universe in such a way that we grow in wisdom. We learn more as we get older, that our lives become layered and textured um, with insight from the moment we have any sort of conscious awareness all the way through our own deaths. And so we are always changing. And that means that the way we apprehend Jesus 
is always changing too. Um, personally, um, I very much at this point in my life uh, lean into a form of theology that um, people call process theology. And that is the idea that this kind of relationality is at the center of the universe and that in effect, the act of creative change is always, is, is part of the very nature of God. So I'm a, a little less um, uh, certain of the territory that Jesus always remains the same uh, than I was uh, say even five or 10 years ago. But laying even that aside, it, it remains true that we change. And so to tell our stories of Jesus is to tell a story of change. And to tell our stories of Jesus is really to enact, I think, what is the, the, the first wisdom of Christian theology. If we consider that Paul is really the first theologian of this tradition, Paul's central question is a question that involves relationality and change. And Paul himself goes through his work and Jesus doesn't really show up twice as the same character. Jesus is constantly new uh, for Paul. So the biblical story itself and theological stories are also stories of experience. And so freeing Jesus becomes an invitation to walk past the old argument of Jesus of history and the Christ of faith, even with all we've learned about both creeds and the sort of the history of, of Christianity and the understandings that are deep and rich of historical scholarship about who Jesus was 2000 years ago and what it was like to live in the ancient Roman empire. Uh, we have all of that, but I literally felt at this point in my life, I wanted to move the discussion onto new territory, this territory of experience and open up a conversation where we can talk more easily and more honestly about the Jesus who both is still compelling and yet is confounding um, at the same time. This is important, I think, for not only us um, as part of a, a path of, of maturity. You know, it's one of the things, of course, we're always supposed to seek after as Christians, uh, spiritual maturity. Keep growing in these narratives. Keep going more deeply and understanding who God is and how to love God and how to love our neighbors. So Christian maturity calls, calls forth. Uh, towards us. I think it's also very important for uh, church communities uh, because right now so many people are leaving church. The latest studies show that we are now at a point in American culture where less than half of Americans attend any kind of religious uh, congregation on even a semi-regular basis. And the la latest number is 47% of Americans are members of any kind of religious congregation at all. But it's even more important, I think, for us as a society. Because even while people are moving past um, religious labels and who understand themselves to no longer be Christian, in effect, all of America is becoming what uh, Flannery O'Connor once described as Christ haunted. The memories of Christianity will stay with us as a nation and as a people long after uh, Christian affiliation um, continues to slide to whatever number it finally slides to. And that means that there will be this sort of haunting memory of Jesus for a long time to come. And the question will be, what kind of Jesus haunts us? Will it be a Jesus that you might describe on the pieces of paper in front of you? Will it be the kind of multifaceted Jesus that Paul constantly is pressing towards in his very inadequate words throughout all of his epistles? 
Will it be the kind of Jesus that I write about in Freeing Jesus, who is a Jesus who takes me from that Sunday school circle to a circle sitting at the World Parliament of Religions in 2015, where I'm only one of uh, two Christians on a stage of 20 women? Will it be that Jesus? Or will it be the kind of Jesus that terrified me on January 6th? I live outside of Washington, D.C., and all of us who were halfway conscious in the last few weeks know that on January 6th, a large group, several thousand people, attacked uh, the Capitol here in Washington, D.C., and they did it for political reasons but they also did it for religious reasons. And the picture that I will never get out of my mind is a photograph of this surging crowd of people carrying weapons, uh, flag poles and clubs and mace, wearing all this military gear with a noose on one side. There was a photograph of a person with a very large sign that said, Jesus saves. Is that the Jesus that will go with us into the American future? Is that the memory, the experience of Jesus that will haunt us? Or is it possible even in a post-Christian society to be haunted of the memories of a Jesus of love, the Jesus of the Beatitudes, the Jesus that Paul describes as a prism. Freeing Jesus is about freeing ourselves. It's about freeing the church. And it's about freeing us from the cultural Jesus who would send us toward a bleak and violent future. And that's why this book was both a joy to write and came out of some really deep moments of my own life. And it also at the very end spoke to me of how much it is needed. And I'm very happy to share it with you today. And I really look forward to talking to Bill and Mike uh, about how they responded to uh, reading this text and the questions they might have. Well, um, I'll just start by saying thank you, Diana, for <clears throat> that uh, whirlwind, I think, overview <clears throat> of what you write in your book. Um, so just to remind everybody, we're going to go for about maybe 15, 20 minutes of questions that Bill and I have directly about what she wrote, and then we'll, we'll open it up to everybody. But in that in-between time of opening it up with everybody, we have a survey that we, we will populate for you. And uh, before you leave today, we'd love it if you could fill that out. Um, so Bill, do you want to go or do you want me to go? Yeah, I'll be happy to go first. Okay. You know, I was <clears throat> by the experiential approach. Uh, that's something that in our Sunday school class we've been talking about. I think it's certainly a far more effective way of being able to discuss your faith position. You talk about friends in your first chapter. And I, I, in thinking of it in an experiential sort of way, it's almost like leaven and bread. That friendships lend itself toward movement toward positive social justice. Would you take a minute and explain how you see that uh, coming out? Yeah, um, I actually love that chapter and um, it's really been striking to me. I mentioned it while I was giving the larger talk that I've had all these podcasts this week, mostly with 30 something um, ex evangelical guy podcasters. And um, they're great. And I, I, some of them have become dear friends and some of them are some of my biggest fans. And um, 
it's fascinating to me that the category of friend was nearly completely absent uh, from their world, despite the fact that sometimes mainliners criticize evangelicalism for not having a kind of a robust enough view of Jesus. You know, you'll say, oh, those people all over there, all they ever do is sing Jesus as my boyfriend music, for example. That's a criticism you often hear in liberal churches towards evangelicals. And so I, I take this idea of friend, which is wrapped up in that first memory of sitting in that Sunday school classroom um, with Miss Jean reading uh, about Jesus and showing the picture of Jesus. And I talk about those experiences and, and not just that one, but also um, some other early memories that I have. Uh, one of the things that I did when I was really teeny tiny is uh, took the Jesus from the manger scene because I was I was so worried about Jesus living in that terrible uh, you know shed in the backyard uh, in the manger because that's what it looked like to me the manger scene looked like a shed in the backyard and so I I took Jesus out of there and I remember my my parents were like where where did Jesus go where did Jesus go and uh, they found Jesus in my Barbie house <laughs> because I, I literally thought that Jesus would be more comfortable living in a suburban two-story than he was in the manger scene. And so I put Jesus in the Barbie house. And so there's like that story and there's stories about me hanging out in the woods when I was a little kid and Jesus was almost like one of the little woodland creatures in, in uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, you know, hanging out in the woods with me. And so, so I take all those stories, which have a lot of charm, and I, I actually put them as close as I can into the voice of a three or four year old girl. And that's kind of the literary power of this book, actually. And some secular readers who have come to me about this, uh, talk to me about this book, especially uh, bookstore people, they're stunned by the voice in the book that I'm able to recapture things like that, looking at the world like a three-year-old girl. Um, and so I take that experience and then of course, I don't leave it at the three-year-old girl. I come up to where I am now, 62-year-old Diana, and I reflect on that experience. And so I draw that experience into Christian history and into uh, biblical sort of deepening. So one of the places that I do with friend, excuse me, while it's easy to think about friend, it's a very charming and kind of even nostalgic category. I look at it through several different lenses. The biblical lens, which is extraordinary. I think that the one thing that I carry through this um, from writing the book until now is a new theological appreciation of the category of friendship throughout both the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament, which is a very powerful theme and one that we often overlook. But then I also do it through history because I love history. And the piece I pick up is finding out many years later, um, writing about Jesus's friend. And then many years later, I discover that my family's history in Maryland is very wrapped up in the history of the Quakers here. My very first ever Scottish and English ancestors who came to Maryland in the 1660s uh, were Quakers. And uh, gosh, only knows why they came, probably because they were being persecuted in England and Scotland. And um, this, the Quakers, of course, are known as, that's their nickname. Their real name is the Religious Society of Friends. And the theological underpinning of the Religious Society of Friends is a, basically a single doctrine. And that's the idea that God is found in every single one of us, that the inner light of God dwells in all of us. And uh, Christians, of course, refer to that also as the, the light of Christ. And so this light, because it dwells in all of us, is that means that we're all completely equal. And so the religious society of friends uh, were among the very first ever white Europeans to question slavery. And they were also uh, the very first white Europeans to argue that women should be uh, preachers and uh, 
that everyone had the act had access to the word of God. And so the very first ever text, uh, women speaking uh, justified, uh, uh, was a call to the full participation of women in the community of, of faith, uh, was written by Quaker woman, Margaret Fell. And uh, some of the very first ever anti-slavery tracts um, in Western history are written by Quakers. So what their point was, is that equality comes out of friendship. We all have this inner light. That means that God has befriended all of us. The light of God shines forth from all of us. God wants us to all be in friendship with God. And because God is in friendship with all of us, we need to all be in friendship with one another. No person is ever to be treated any differently than any other person. And that means social justice and complete equality. So I arc from Jesus in my Barbie house to <laughs> writing about how friendship is the very basis of a life of doing justice. And that's a good model, I think, of the way each one of these chapters works. Um, Three-year-old Diana and 60-year-old Diana preaching a sermon on social justice. Uh, to follow up on Bill, just uh, uh, seg follow up and then segue from Bill, uh, you know, as a Roman historian, that is, uh, that's where I really am drawn to is amicus is not something you would say to anybody, right? Um, it, it conveys so much in, and what, what I was happy to see where you just got to, it's an equalness uh, to a friend. And this is in terms of the male oriented world and way they wrote about friendship in the, at least the first century uh, BC AD is, is uh, men who called themselves friends were in a class that nobody else would have been unless you extended that circle of friendship. And they could be your protector, your advocate, uh, your close confidant, intimacy in terms of being able to talk in ways that they never would have with people outside. So there's a, and you, they can only feel the way to do it because of this nature. So this notion of equality, I see you as myself, right? Now, there, there's a certain element of superiority there, but nonetheless, that, that is within this realm of, of, of belonging, belonging. I think that was the wonderful way to, 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 to go that we'll bring up friendship stuff again, but I want to bring up something about teaching your, your chapter on teaching. Um, you, you talk about the golden rule and you have this amazing section on parables. And I was just wondering if you could expand or tell us a little bit about uh, Jesus's model of teaching and, and what he was trying to teach. Maybe man, that's a lot, but uh, just <laughs> let you go with that. Well, I, I enjoyed writing that because of course I am a teacher and that's my, that is my vocation. I love it. I was a teacher in formal institutions like you, Mike, for about 14 years of my life in college settings. And in the more, you know, the last 12 years or so of my life, it's all been itinerant teaching. So, so, so I think a lot, I reflect a lot on teaching. Um, this, this image of Jesus as teacher, of course, is the image that comes from elementary school, Methodist Sunday school, where if there is one thing that the Methodists in the 1960s wanted to get into the heads of every single person in the denomination is that Jesus was a great teacher. And, um, so, so I explore that territory and I, Jesus teaches in a way that is in some senses fairly conventional um, and does things that we would expect teachers to do. Uh, Jesus communicates information. Um, he shares with uh, his students kind of like the rules of the classroom. And so you see Jesus in uh, settings throughout the New Testament uh, reminding people of how they're supposed to behave towards one another. And that's you know, part of the act of, of teaching is creating community through establishing guidelines of, of behavior of how the disciples should treat one another. And then there's also, there's the content piece and Jesus is, Jesus loves content. Blessed are the poor, blessed are the, the those who are hungry, blessed are those who mourn. Um, 
you know, uh, if a person takes your coat or, or wants your coat, give him your cloak also. And so Jesus has a whole bunch of stuff, you know, that, that he actually does teach in a fairly straightforward way. But then Jesus does something else too, is that while he instructs and gives rules, you know, for community, he also turns, he pivots and he interweaves that with these masterful stories and so jesus gives instructions jesus gives rules and jesus tells stories and we call the stories of course the the parables and um, the parables are designed not to have a single interpretation and um, they're designed to make the students have to sort of live into the material themselves and maybe even have a fight about the meaning of what the story is that the teacher just told. And so um, I, I, I loved, I used to love doing that in my classrooms. Uh, one of the things that I would do with a unit that I taught, a lot, and this is not in the book, but this is just, you know, kind of me reflecting on what I did write in the book. I did a unit on the how to read the slavery texts in 19th century America. And so I just literally put out um, three or four different uh, written documents, sermons, uh, little pieces of biblical interpretation, where some people interpreted the text about slavery to point towards freedom of the enslaved persons, whereas other people use those same texts to show how slavery was biblically justified or, and, and that it was, it was right and good to do. And so I literally would, I wouldn't say anything. I would just put all that material in the classroom along with the biblical references. And I would say to the students who has the better argument. And so in fact, I was sort of setting up a parable by showing them a story through text, you know, a, a fight in the interpretation. And then I didn't tell them which one they were supposed to believe. I literally let them fight them out in class. And I'll never forget one of the days that was probably the most dramatic teaching day I ever had when I did this. And I had, I, I would always warn the African-American students in my class beforehand that I was doing it so that they would come into class and be emotionally prepared for it because I what both of us knew when I would tell the students and then you know what I knew is that a lot of the white students would say a lot of really stupid racist things and and I wanted them to just know that was probably going to happen and for them to be emotionally prepared and if they wanted to skip class that day if they felt like they couldn't handle it that was all right and we could set up an alternative assignment so um this one time I did that with the, I think there were three black students in, uh, and I taught my first job was in a very white college, but I think there were three black students in this one class this semester. And I, I told them a day in advance. And the next day, all three of these young men came into the class and sat down and this exercise began. And of course, you know, some of, uh, I, some of the white students started saying really stupid th racist things, which always happened. And the black students, said, you know, that's right. And I sat there and what happened was the black students then took on the task of defending the pro-slavery side in the Bible. And the more that the black students defended like James Thornwell and Robert Dabney, who were like the Southern defenders of slavery, the more the white students start saying, but wait a second, isn't that racist? Isn't that wrong? You can't hold people in slavery. And it was like watching a living parable because the least expected people took the side that literally was as if it, it that contributed to their own oppression. And when they did that, it revealed the ugly stupidity that was at the heart of the 19th century pro-slavery argument. And they convinced all of the other students in class to move away from any kind of racist stance with these texts. And, and that 
story right there, that's a parable. It's unexpected. It turns the world upside down of the people who hear and experience it. You walk away changed. And so that's what a parable is. And that's the kind of teacher Jesus was. Teaches information, teaches rules of the road, teaches how people should behave, but then knits those in with these unexpected moments where everything gets turned inside, outside, upside down. And I just have to say, um, sort of as a sort of a, a wonderful commercial, one of the, the, the black students, his name was Reggie Williams, and he has become one of the most prominent uh, theologians, African-American theologians um, of this current generation. He wrote an amazing book called Bonhoeffer's Black Jesus. He's working on a book right now, The Spirituality of the Harlem Renaissance. And um, he is a professor of theology and ethics at McCormick uh, Theological Seminary um, in Chicago. And literally, I could not be prouder. Uh, I, I mean, I want to put on my resume that he was in <laughs> two of my classes when I first was a teacher because there, he is a brilliant, brilliant teacher. And it showed up that day when he was 18 years old, um, sitting in that classroom. And so I think that that shows up too in the Bible. You know, you sort of see how some of these, these inept disciples are going to actually show up to be kind of wise people later on. And, um, so, so that's what, uh, teaching is all about. And that's the kind of teacher Jesus is. Bill, you are on mute. Yep, yep. Uh, I'm going <laughs> to continue that segue in, in the parables because I'm fascinated with it. Obviously, Jesus thought this to be a very effective way. Rabbinical teaching, as I understand it, is predicated, according to Amy Little, uh, Jill Levine, on the provoking of the discussion, the argument, yep. in order to find an inner truth. I believe that to be true. And I also look at the liturgies of most, most churches that I've experienced over time. And it's the answer, not the questioning that is dominant. How do you see that moving forward? Well, I think we just have to keep pushing against that, you know, because that's part of one of these, you know, sort of cultural accretions around Jesus. Um, there, I don't know if they still publish these, but for many years, you would see on cars, just going down the road, Jesus is the answer. And so there's within the cultural Jesus, this expectation of certainty and that that's a very bad expectation to have because Jesus, the only thing I think that Jesus taught his disciples to be certain of was that love was the guiding presence of God in their midst and that they were supposed to love their neighbors. That's the certainty of Jesus is love. And of course, what anyone knows, um, well, what does that mean? You know, all you have to do is be in one relationship of love to know that love raises more questions uh, <laughs> than it often answers. But the only thing that ultimately does remain, even at the, at, at, even, you know, at the very end is that sense of love. Um, but the questions are the thing that are combustible through even the most loving of lifetime relationships. I would just like to add that that breaking, th you know, there's a there's a thing about the. And I hate to use these dichotomies of East and West truth seeking. In the West, the tradition has been to seek truth, the answer. In the there's this common notion in the East. Um, there is no seeking because there are no questions. <laughs> Things just are, and your kind of journey to that is is in view, but with relationships that you have with people, relationships you have with nature, like all of this kind of encompassing sense of being is where truth comes from. So things just are. Now that's the philosophical thing. Um, people like Rodney Stark, right? Um, years and years ago, writing his, his book, One True God, and the explanation for how the West came to be the West, the birth of science, because of this need to find the answer. Um, and that may be true, but it's also, there's an edge to that, like what you are describing, right? There's, a, there's another side, a very sharp side 
to what happens when you are not the one who has the correct answer or a perceived answer by a source of authority, um, which can be very ugly very quickly. Wasn't that really kind of the difference between the Greek and the Hebrew? The Greek wants to know, how does it work? And yes. the Hebrew says, what does it mean? What does it mean? So, you know, we're, we're more Plato <laughs> than Jesus in many of these things. Maybe so. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering, so we're about 20 minutes into this, and, um, you know, people have been populating a few questions, and I'm wondering if this is a good time to... Uh, one, release the survey, Brendan, if you might, would that be good? And then we kind of segue into facilitating uh, folks asking questions. Would that be all right? Yeah, and, yeah, and the yeah. survey is really very easy and very quick to do. So if you- Yeah, and, and you can do that as we're talking. You can just use your cursor to move it off to the side. And like, also scroll down on it because there's more yeah. than three questions. <laughs> yeah, you want to scroll down. So just to remind everyone about sort of the house rules of how we'll do this is um, there's a raise your hand button. Uh, if you move your cursor to the bottom of your screen, a yellow hand, raise your hand. You click that. Uh, we already have a question in there, so we'll start with that. And then uh, Brandon will release you. And you can either show your face or not, but you'll be on audio at that point. And then, um, uh, or you can communicate through the chat, which some people have already. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll drop in on those. Uh, and if it gets kind of silent for a while, Bill and I have other questions as well. So um, that'll be good. Oh, how, how does that sound? Is that okay? Okay, so uh, we do have uh, uh, two questions in the, in the question and answer already. Again, you, everyone, you can ask in the question and Q&A if you want, but the chat is a really nice place for everybody kind of see things and you can scroll back. Um, Lindsay uh, Linsky asked early on, uh, when you talk about sides, when you uh, originally, uh, when you first started Danitz, and she says, hasn't there always been sides in Christian history, differing perspectives in faith? Look at the discussion over circumcision in the book of Acts, for example, uh, perhaps it's healthy to have a variety of views. Uh, Phyllis Tickles, the great awakening comes to mind. Any thoughts? No, that's a that's a really good question. You know, there's a difference between a uh, diversity of views and healthy sorts of arguments within the community and sides. You know, um, and I think that there's there are these moments when the diversity becomes explosive, exclusive, um, you know, and violent. Uh, we see it all through the history of Christianity when it it's more than just okay, you know, well, you, you might believe in infant baptism and you believe in believer's baptism. And, and so we have this diversity and that's still present within Christianity, but it was deeply problematic when the people who believed in infant baptism decided to put rocks around the necks of the people who believed in adult believer's baptism and threw them in rivers throughout Europe and drowned them as heretics. And so that's, I think, the difference between diversity and sides. Um, and what we have now is we have sides and there is, there, there are diversities. I have plenty of friends that I have differing views on things with and differing interpretations. And yet we can, you know, sit down at dinner or have a productive conversation in a podcast or, you know, learn from one another. Um, and then I know people who literally want to create new kinds of crusades um, in their denominations. And like that, I the example I gave was Carol, Carol Howard Merritt, when she simply quoted Paul Tillich, all of a sudden there was a group of young ministers who wanted to strip her of her ordination. And um, that's uh, that, that becomes problematic. So I appreciate Lindsay's remark because we do learn from those diversities. And oftentimes we decide you know, in an argue, in an ar a real argument, you can have a real argument about different opinions. We we sometimes will decide. Well, you know, really, this this practice probably is not the most life giving practice. This is probably not the best direction for the whole of the church, and we should probably limit it limit that. Um, but when it moves over into this other thing, which it so often has in church history, um, that becomes really dangerous and horrible territory to, to occupy. Um, Martha Eskew asks, asked, um, can you pull apart the Jesus as person from the teachings of Jesus? 
The teachings seem to be the most important piece. I love the teacher that brought the world the teaching of the loving God um, and how to be a part of the loving God. Uh, incarnation, not salvation. Comments? Um, I don't think that Jesus can ever be separated from his from the teachings. I think that uh, one of the things that I talk about in this chapter is of all of the terms that are used for Jesus within the Gospels. Now here we're not talking the whole of the New Testament. We're only talking the Gospels. Uh, the one that's used most often for Jesus by the people who knew Jesus, at least, you know, we have to put this all in the mouth of the writers of the, of the Gospels, etc. But the, the term that's used most often is teacher, is rabbi. And um, a couple of people have cited Amy, Amy Jill Levine already uh, today. And, and Amy Jill was one of the editors of the Jewish annotated um, commentary on the New Testament, the Jewish annotated New Testament. And when I was working on freeing Jesus, I often use that commentary because it was really helpful to free up my own, uh, you know, completely Christianized prejudices of Jesus by looking at the Jewish annotated New Testament. And so here I was writing, doing this chapter on Jesus and they have a fairly sizable entry in that, um, that book talking about the development of rabbinic Judaism in the first century. And what was happening in the first century is that Judaism was shifting. It was becoming what we now know as rabbinic Judaism and this idea of a rabbi who you know gathers these sorts of communities and who riffs on uh, the Torah and the prophets, etc. Um, this was a this was a revolutionary new idea in the first century, and so that Jesus friends called him a rabbi, man. Essentially, Jesus and his friends were participating in what was then a radically new religious movement that was emerging in Judaism and um, that in the new, in that Hebrew, uh, excuse me, in the Jewish annotated new Testament, it says that Jesus is actually the earliest historically attested person that we know of to be called rabbi. And so the very earliest evidence we have of rabbinic Judaism is actually the new Testament. And I think that that just blows me away. And the fact that Mary Magdalene, you know, we get the, the John account of the resurrection. Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb. Jesus isn't there. There's the two angels and she's crying. Where have they taken my Lord? And a uh, voice says, Mary, why are you weeping? She said, she thinks it's the gardener. She turns around and oh my gosh, she says, uh, Raboni. So Mary Magdalene, her first words to her beloved Jesus in witness to the resurrection is actually to call Jesus by the word teacher. And honestly, if it's the most used name of Jesus in the gospels, if Jesus is a participant in this this first century movement and literally attests to this dramatic and exciting change within Judaism. And Mary Magdalene calls Jesus that on the morning of the resurrection, you know what? I think Jesus is a teacher. And if we don't get that, if we don't get how radical that is, that's on us. Um, so I don't ever want to separate Jesus from that. That's, that is who Jesus was to his friends. Um, Brendan, I think we saw a hand raised. Uh, is it possible to go to that person? I'm not sure if they're still raised. Yep, they're in. But uh, someone needs to mute themselves, unmute themselves. Edward. I think Edward thinks he's talking. Edward, you want to unmute yourself? Um, click the microphone to the left. There he is. Oh, look at where Edward is, unless that is a screen. That's a yeah, screen. A screen. <laughs> I, keep, I keep meaning to get that out because I keep fading in and out and all kinds of stuff. Uh, 
I put a question in and I thought I'd like to discuss it. Borg says, believe what you want to believe. What does it mean to you? Now, I've got friends, even family, that I'm not sure will shake them loose from believing. They may answer, well, I believe Jesus saves. You know, it's, it's how do you get them to start thinking beyond that? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you know, Edward, I believe Jesus saves too. And I'm really interested in how your question relates to one that's in the chat right now from Catherine. Um, and Catherine's check, uh, question is, I'm stuck by, struck by a missing chapter. Jesus is healer. Is that woven into other chapters? And so at this point in my life, I am far less uh, concerned about going at people and saying, you know, oh, your idea that Jesus is savior is wrong or what have you or incomplete. Uh, but what I would love to do is to say, well, how does Jesus save? What do you mean? What do you mean when Jesus, you say Jesus saves? And just kind of get their story. Nine times out of 10, in the circumstance you kind of describe, I'm pretty sure they're going to say, say, well, I'm saved from my sins so that I can go to heaven. And if that was the conversation that I was having, um, and I certainly could have it because I write about how many of my friends are uh, still within evangelicalism. And so, so I would say, well, that's, that's right. You know, the Bible does talk about Jesus saving us from our sins, but did you know that there are all these other ways that, that the Bible talks about salvation and the Bible talks about salvation as healing, which is Catherine's question. Uh, because, of course, the word salvation we even have in English comes out of the Latin word salvus uh, for healing or to be made whole. And that's related to the to the Greek for the same. So uh, Jesus is a savior. Yes, that means that Jesus is is it heals. Jesus heals um, our broken brokenness. Jesus heals us from what is. Uh, wounded uh, personally and in our societies, Jesus, yes, Jesus heals us. Uh, but there are other images of salvation as well, some of which I cover in my chapter of Jesus as Savior. Um, some people need to be saved because they feel like they're lost and not at home. And they need to find a new place where they dwell in safety. Um, some people need to be saved from violence and so in that sense jesus becomes a refuge or a place of of safety um, salvation can mean liberation as it does in the exodus is that jesus um, is this liberative figure who comes into the world into our lives and sets the captives free and of course we get that jesus even announces that at the beginning of uh, his ministry, that that's what it's going to be all about. It's going to be about setting the captives free. And so the problem is not so much that Jesus is savior. The problem is that American Christianity has picked out one aspect of what it means to save and has kind of gotten hung up on that. And so when I have a conversation with a friend who is still more in that, you know, sort of evangelical frame of mind, Jesus saves, my first step towards that conversation is yes, indeed, Jesus does save. Like that crazy sign that was on the, at the insurrection on January 6th, I agree with the sign, Jesus saves. But in the context of what was happening there, I would love to ask that guy, what do you mean Jesus saves when that's a sign that becomes surrounded by violence? And so then you move into what does salvation mean? What, what, what do you need to be saved from? And so, so that's the kind of way that I love to proceed with these kinds of questions and the way I do in the book. One of the uh, perceptions I have being a uh, minister and a pastoral counselor for 26 years is that I think, or I feel like some of these people who are so rigid and stuck on these uh, beliefs have a lot of fear and they need rigid structure 
to keep them from, you know, being harmed or losing their safety. Uh, I'm in the process of writing a book right now called Evolving Christianity, which uh, I'm wanting to address this to these people uh, to bring uh, this whole concept of, uh, uh, somebody said elevator Christianity with uh, heaven and That was me. Hell. Uh, <laughs> That was probably you because I've been reading your It book. was me. <laughs> it was in yeah. another book that I wrote, right? Good. I, I need to notate that in my notes. <laughs> uh, I love being quoted to myself. Thank you. <laughs> right. Um, but, um, you know, to, to bring it to that relational point, uh, to have a relationship with the Christ. Uh, I don't think a lot of people, like you said, and a lot hasn't been said about that, uh, look at that side of uh, Jesus. I mean, you know, we stuck on the historical thing. I know in my own life when I have, um, and right now it's just amazing what's coming out writing this book. Um, mm in some ways, how stuck I was. Yep. Uh, and, uh, you know, discovering that, uh, well, you know, I looked at Jesus 2000 years ago, you know, and, and it, it wasn't as real to me as it is now when I'm looking at the fact that I have divinity too. Yeah. You know, I am in relationship with the divine Christ and, you know, with love and all those things, I have that divinity too. And that is helping me respect myself more and respect other people. Thank yeah, you. I love that. And it, that's a great testimony to this idea of the power of Jesus of experience. You just gave your own Jesus of experience story. I used to think this, and now I came to this sort of wider understanding. It's really beginning to change me, and I look at the world differently. Um, that's what happened to me while I was writing this book. I, I literally was able to let go of so much stuff that had gotten me wrapped in knots about trying to fix um, other people around me or fix the world. Now I'm still very, you know, I'm an activist. I've, I'm involved in all these causes. I want things to be better, but I've given up a, a kind of, I think a sense of my like need to possess control of how those things happen and live more easily into my own experience of how change occurs. And I think maybe turn the prism on how I engage, um, my passion for making for helping the world to be a more just just place so in effect i i don't remember who asked me this this week i've now talked to so many wonderful people but i realized that if we take this category of jesus of experience and ask ourselves you know how did i who were the different jesus's i experienced over time it's almost like a version of the life it's almost like a life practice of what the Jesuits call the daily examine, uh, where every single day the Jesuit uh, practice is you go to bed at night and you ask yourself, um, uh, what, it, what did I do? Where did I fail? And what did I do well? And what can I be grateful for? And so you do this, this short exercise in examining your life that day and you ended always in gratitude and I realized after I finished this book that what I had done is I'd done a life examine that it wasn't just a day that I was looking at mm -hmm. but I was looking at my whole life and when I when I did a life examine I saw something so differently and it really loosened up my own heart and so um, I guess you could say writing freeing Jesus freed me mm -hmm. And so, so, so I appreciate your testimony there too, because I heard, I heard that in your own words. And I, I really, I really like that. We got well, a lot. Thank, you, know, thank you for responding. Uh, I'm not going to take up any more. Thanks, Edward.
Th thanks, Edward. Um, it, it, because of what that dialogue just uh, brought out about exp the, the experiential aspect, there, Barbara uh, wrote a while ago, uh, what kind of experience of Jesus are we giving different age groups today in mainline um, liberal churches? Are you aware of what your sense of that? You know, I, I'm not. And that's the, the, I think that the most interesting thing in writing about a book about Jesus of experience, and th this kind of relates to, I think, Edward's question too, is that when you write about your own experience, the the first wisdom you should learn, I think, is that not everybody shares it. Is that our experience is very unique to ourselves. And I, uh, half of the problems I'm convinced in Christianity come from, ev from people thinking that everybody else needs to have the exact same experience that they do. And so when, when you write your own experience, you, I don't think that good memoir is ever about me. What I see good memoir as being is an invitation to everyone who is reading a book that is a memoir or who is engaging a conversation about memoir is every person in this room should now be thinking about, oh my gosh, what is my first memory of Jesus? Or, or would I say that, you know, when I was in elementary school, my primary thought about Jesus was that Jesus was a teacher. So what it's doing is it's inviting you into your memoir. Good memoir invites everyone into their memoir. And as you can gather then, these stories around a table, you begin to get a fuller picture of who God is or who Jesus is or whatever question you're exploring through this life examine. And so I'm really curious. You know, I am so curious as to how um, my daughter, who's 23, how she might write the first two or three chapters of, of her own book. And I suspect that my daughter's first chapter might well be a chapter about Jesus being uh, a vision of justice. I suspect that she would say something about justice, about real equality. Um, just knowing kind of how she grew up, where she grew up, the church setting she grew up. Jesus as the maker of justice or Jesus as the bringer of justice. And that would be different than my Jesus of the Barbie house in the woods in the Sunday school classroom of the 1960s. So, and that's okay. Uh, it's more than okay because the more stories are around the table, I think the more acceptance, the more listening, the more love, the bigger picture we get of God, the more sense of empowerment we get. I think that's amazing uh, that we could construct a kind of a memoir of memoirs of Jesus in our own time. Um, there's a couple of interesting comments and not questions in the chat. And I'll just kind of rattle off a few. Uh, John it says he hears echoes of Howard Thurman's work. Um, watch. This might be a question. Do you engage his voice in this fascinating dialogue, his voice uh, of the unity of all humanity and his experiential focus uh, seems to be helpful. Thank you for your ongoing thoughtfulness. And then another one, um, which goes back to something earlier, I was thinking the same way. And, and for, for Cindy, um, you, you end your book with this idea of Jesus in the circle, which I thought was really a wonderful image. And Cindy writes, I was thinking while listening in the Islamic world, presence is called Allah. In the East, it's called Zen. I still call myself Christian because Jesus is the Tao that can't be named, uh, that I grew up with. And I, I really interesting. Um, so then uh, there is a question. I'm going to go back to the, and you can feel free to chime in that, but um, there's a question. Do you believe that your African-American student that you spoke, or the, actually all three of them planned that approach uh, in that teaching lesson that you, it just seems like they did, right? They must, yes, they did. Right? <laughs> yeah. They told me that later. Okay. <laughs> Is that now, they purposefully decided to take that aside. What, what an amazing thing. Um, so here's a more meaty one um, and try to do your best. Uh, and I, Lisa asks, um, unfortunately, my internet uh, cut out. Can you explain the view 
of, of the resurrection, your view of the resurrection of Jesus and how it comes to play in your book. Yeah. Um, part there. Well, I, first of all, the question about Howard Thurman, Howard Thurman, I think shows up in one or two footnotes, but it's, you know, there are lots of people who have influenced me that just kind of weave in and out of my own journey that don't necessarily even show up in a footnote. Uh, but uh, but Thurman does get a call out. I believe it's in the friend chapter where I talk about how he made a, a, a pilgrimage of friendship to Gandhi and that it was this idea of somehow if you can make a pilgrimage of friendship, it will change the world if you, you know, if you reach out and make friends with the right people. So, so uh, very good s s person who, who pulled that one out. And I, and I love that. Uh, yeah. Jesus is my Tao. Wow. I'm going to carry that with me for the rest of the day. Kind of be rumin on the, ruminating on that. Thank you for that comment. Um, the resurrection. The way that the resurrection shows up in this book is experientially. And um, I talk about in the later chapters how it, the book really divides in three parts. Uh, teacher and a friend and teacher are about my earliest uh, childhood experiences. And there's a kind of a, a warmth and even a sort of a nostalgic haze in those chapters. And they're both located within the context of mainline Methodism in the 1960s up to about 1972. And then the middle two chapters, Savior and Lord, take place once my family moves to Arizona in 1972. And we become unmoored, as it were, from uh, the mainline church that I grew up in. And my parents stopped going to church for all kinds of reasons. I can just say them. I mean, I, it's not I'm not going to be shy about it. It's it, they're not in the book, uh, but the main reason I have talked about this in some other settings, and I've never really written down the article, is that my that my dad was bisexual or gay. We I still to this day don't even really know all of the details of his story, but my grandfather found out, and uh, basically kicked us <laughs> out of uh, out of Maryland, and my parents wound up in Arizona. And um, that meant, of course, in 1972, that church was not the really first place you'd probably go to try to solve those questions in 1972. And so my parents just, they got me and my brother confirmed, and then they stopped going to church for a really long time until they figured out their own, their own issues. So, so that meant as an adolescent, I, adolescent, I was left on my own. And um, I wound up in a Bible church in Scottsdale, Arizona that still exists. And when I went there in the early 70s, it had 300 members. It now has, I think, 20,000, 15, 20,000 members. So it's still in business. Um, so the, those two chapters take place within evangelicalism. And then the final two chapters take place in my more recent life, where many of my readers know me as an Episcopalian, as a progressive Christian, as a person who is a writer engaged in this sort of larger vision of uh, wanting a better world. So, so it's those three stages. The, the shift between chapter four and chapter five, from leaving evangelicalism toward becoming something different is the place mostly where I talk about resurrection. Because while I really appreciate and I write, and this will surprise people, I think, in this group, if you read the book, I write about evangelicalism in chapters three and four in the warmest, most gracious way I have ever written about evangelicalism. And this is very counterintuitive because right now it's very popular to write about white evangelicalism in very critical and even angry ways. And I don't do that. I write about it in a deeply appreciative way. And yet those experiences, while they gave me much that was good, also led me down a pathway that I figured out was not life-giving. And for me, evangelicalism of the 1970s by the mid 1980s had taken me into a narrow, restrictive, 
neo-Calvinist, judgmental, Christ, a bloody Christ dying on a cross kind of world. You have to hate uh, women, gay people, anybody who's different and anybody who disagrees with you, planet. And um, folks who know me now uh, might never guess that for three or four years of my life, I spent it in this ugly part of Christianity where you would not recognize me. I did not recognize me. And that was the thing that eventually terrified me is that I had been theologically sort of taken down this road and I contributed to that. I'm not blaming anybody. I willing, I was a willing participant in the, in the journey, but I got to a place where I realized that I was doing violence to myself and doing violence to others. And that was so far from anything I could imagine about myself. And so what that meant is I had effectively, and this goes to the resurrection question, I had effectively died. And what do you do when your own soul is dead? And that's when I have to figure out where do I go from here? And what I have known over the years is that people, when they find themselves on such paths, sometimes they'll just say, oh, it's not as bad as I think. It'll be fine. I'm just going to stay on the road. Um, or they just kind of get stuck. Uh, but I decided that I, to go back and find the fork in the road and go a different way. And so in effect, I I literally let myself go through Holy Saturday. And then my life changed uh, when I found where that fork in the road was and I started moving down a different road. And I remember at that time, I, I literally asked a Episcopal bishop who what he thought of the resurrection because I was asking these questions you know about the historical Jesus and questions I was not allowed to ask when I was way down the neo-Calvinist road because there was all kinds of stuff you had to believe there um and so I asked this Episcopal bishop a very liberal guy uh you know do you believe in the resurrection and he he looked at me and he said um of course I believe in the resurrection I've seen it too many times not to and so this amazing bishop, he was one of the first bishops to ever ordain women in the Episcopal church. He moved my question from a, do you believe in the historical resurrection? Do you believe what the creeds say? You know, the, the divided question. And he, he answered it experientially. He said, oh, of course I believe in the resurrection. I've seen it too many times not to. And in the book, I say, I think I became more evidence for his case. <laughs> because my whole life was resurrected. And so that's how I think of the resurrection. You know, I have seen it so many times that it's impossible for me not to believe in the resurrection. And when I say believe, I'm not talking about intellectual category of conceptualizing exactly how that would happen scientifically or what have you. I'm talking about believe as in trust, believe as in, oh my gosh, this idea holds my heart because I have seen it so many times. And so that's how I believe in the resurrection. And as the other stuff, the historical and scientific stuff, so much of that is mystery. And it, I always tell people, I might have a PhD in history from Duke, but talking about the historiography of the resurrection is well beyond the pay grade uh, that I arrived at through my Duke, Duke degree. So I am comfortable. I'm comfortable enough um, in church uh, being able to just, you know, say the creeds. I recognize them for what they are. They're philosophical and theological poetry from the third and fourth centuries that explain the experience of Christians who lived at that time. I can go along with that. That's, I, I can say them in that way. Yeah. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, you know, I also recognize all these interesting historical questions that have developed over the years. Yet I've seen the resurrection so many times that I, that I trust that it's true. On, on that note of, of, of 
that journey you just talked about, I'm going to conflate two <laughs> comments slash questions together. And the first one is from uh, Kaylee, who says, uh, what do you think about is the biggest difference between the historical Jesus and the religious Jesus? Jesus which one uh, do you think is most prevalent throughout history? And then it kind of segue into a, a question from Martha says, who do we follow, the rabbi? Uh, you know, do we follow Jesus as rabbi or do we worship Jesus? I always thought worshiping Christ is correct and worshiping Jesus is somehow misguided. As Richard War says, Christ is not just Jesus's last name. Christ existed, uh, Christ existed before Jesus, question mark. Um, uh, actually, yes, <laughs> I mean, Christ does. I mean, Christ does exist before Jesus. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God in the beginning and God was with the word in the beginning. And so John chapter one tells us that there is this pre-existing uh, uh, Christ, Christ consciousness, Christ, however you want to say that, the word, um, that's part of the creative energy of the universe, period. Yes. Um, and then the Christ of, uh, the Jesus of history, the Christian theology insists, and and I do agree with this. Um, I at least I follow in these traditions, although I might not agree with every way it's always been talked about in Christian theology, is that the historical Jesus in some way uniquely embodies the Word, that creative consciousness from the very beginning that it was was and with God. And so in that unique embodiment, um, Jesus becomes or is both the historical personage and uh, somehow this sacred embodiment, this divine presence. And, and, you know, people were killed speculating how, how that works. Um, and so the church came up with a couple answers about that. And we kind of have, you know, basically been playing with those answers for about 16 or 1700 years now. So, the, so yes to Richard Rohr's uh, question. And then the question about, you know, which one has been prominent uh, in uh, Christian throughout Christianity, it, to me, it's very clear. Uh, the Christ of faith has far outstripped um, the ideas about Jesus of history. The, the development of the Jesus of history category really has only come in the last maybe 250 years as we've gotten, uh, and I see, see Mike doing this with his head because he teaches historiography, um, as uh, notions of the nature of history have shifted, particularly in the West, um, it's caused us to relook at these texts and these traditions and examine them uh, with a different set of tools, which we understand to be history. And so, so um, yes, the newer one is the Jesus of history and boy, we've learned tons. It's been fantastic. We're still learning amazing stuff um, in that realm. Uh, but that is definitely the minor key of, uh, of, of church history. And, you know, that presents us with some problems, I think, um, in relationship to the question of Jesus as the rabbi and Jesus is the one you worship. And so uh, I, at this point in time, lean much more heavily. I, this is my, my journey, might not be your journey, uh, towards thinking of Jesus as my rabbi. Um, that scene, there's no... Don't, don't be fooled about why I quoted that Mary Magdalene text from uh, John chapter 20. I see myself in the same way I saw myself as the little girl in that picture in Sunday school with her head on Jesus' shoulder. Uh, now, when I look for myself in the New Testament, I see myself as Mary Magdalene at that tomb. Um, weeping and wondering, you know, what have you done with my friend? What have you, what have you done with Jesus? Where is Jesus? And that voice, why are you weeping? Comes towards me and I turn around and I go, oh, Raboni, Rabbi. That's not just Mary Magdalene. That's, that's Diana right now. And so that's where, that's where I am, uh, but it doesn't need to be where you are. You might be somewhere else with that, with those questions. So that means I do have a little more trouble 
as I suspect Mary Magdalene might have in the early church when people started worshiping her friend. <laughs> she might have thought, oh my, should have sat with him at dinner, you know, and had to <laughs> had to sort of clean up his, his mess after he and the disciples left and I had to do the dishes, you know. Uh, you might be less likely to use that Philippians hymn to describe him. Um, so that sounds irreverent, but you know, I just kind of am putting myself back into the story and sort of imagining what it what it might have been like. So I do have a little bit more trouble with the majestic worship songs than I once did, but that's all right. Mm -hmm. That all of that will change in some way, shape, or form. I'm sure as I Good. move into my seventies. <laughs> I was just going to say, you know, the miracle and anything would be that people agree. <laughs> I know, and I that's what I, that people would agree. I, and I just have just such a much more open-ended attitude about this now. Uh, yeah. My main sort of division in the universe now is does it move towards love or does it move towards violence? And that's it. Other than that, I have, I've sort of lost all the other divisions. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, I just want, there's a really nice comment uh, that Russell wrote, said that this Chinese standard translation for logos is Tao. And this is really interesting, you're in your chapter on the way. And then, you know, I think earlier you talk about logos and that problem with that, uh, our common conception of it as word. Um, but that's the segue into also maybe uh, Robert is burning to ask this question in two mediums. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so would you rather say the resurrection is a meta historical reality? Yes. So Robert, you got the shortest answer on record. <laughs> Michael, you are muted. I don't know if you're asking another question at this point. Sorry. Yeah. I'm, um, so I'm, I'm okay. So here's one from Catherine. It's a quick thank you to sharing your story about uh, child's uh, about the child's prayer. I think now I lay me down to sleep. I never heard anyone say they had <clears throat> the same feeling. I imagine Jesus as Wendy and Peter Pan holding my soul in, uh, in a jaw as she did Peter's shadow. Um, I wondered why he would want to keep my soul while I was sleeping and where. He did keep it. And what if he lost it? How could I die uh, in my sleep uh, if Jesus was with me? It was scary. Yeah. I will have to recall that. I remember that prayer too. And it freaked me out. Uh, just <laughs> from a kid's point of view, it, it, it didn't, you know, it, it's like children's stories. Sometimes they're really scary. And I wonder what adults are doing with that. Um, the, yeah. the unintended consequence of, you know, the, the, the plea to, you know, to protect that prayer sound can sound somewhat unsettling. Yeah, the passage that Ka uh, Catherine is referring to, mm -hmm. I'll just read it as a quick paragraph, but I've gotten a lot of really interesting responses on this. People saying, oh my gosh, that, that terrified me too. And I've never heard anybody say that in public. So this is uh, where it comes from in the book. It's from chapter three, the chapter about Jesus as savior. Um, every night, my mother sat on the edge of my bed, held my hand and said, let us pray. Together, we recited, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray thee, Lord, my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray thee, Lord, my soul to take. Evening after evening, with the dusk falling about us, it was the one prayer she taught me. It was not a prayer about blessing food or welcoming the day. No, in my family, the maternal theology lesson was about death. The words intoned for generations were handed down through the Puritans' New England primer to myriads of American children, even those raised by typically sunny Methodist mothers, a prayer of protection against death in the night. And if death should come, a prayer to go safely into the arms of Jesus. And then I run that up against the fact that um, the prayer, it just was, it was so out of place with everything else about my parents because my parents were like characters from Mad Men. Uh, they were like the most sort of 
middle, mid-century modern parents you can possibly imagine. Our house was full of plastic furniture. My mother hated everything that was Victorian. She thought that uh, Victorian stuff was dark and she wanted everything light and big windows. And, and literally um, that my mother recited that prayer to me made no sense. But the prayer was the thing that terrified me. And it was so out of place um, in so many ways in the rest of my world that it really, you know, it popped and it took over my imagination. And so I, I literally lived when I was a little kid with an intense set so, of fear. Let me give you a different perspective. And that is, I think most of us or many of us learned that prayer as we were a child. But probably memory is a funny thing because I remember saying that prayer in a foxhole in Vietnam. Yeah. When shells were coming in and you had nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, memory works like that. That's why I said every story in this kind of theological endeavor, every story counts. And so part of the bigger argument of the book is that you know, Protestants in particular have blabbed on for centuries about the priesthood of all believers. I refer to it as the best idea that no one in Protestantism ever practiced. Um, but as for as great as that idea is, I pushed it kind of one step further in this book. And the bigger argument is we need a theology of all believers. And that is the people are the writers of theology. And that the church has failed to understand that for all these centuries is the church says that only a few people who have rightly handled these texts and these traditions, only they can be considered theologians. But I think we're all theologians. And the, the life of the church in the future depends on us recognizing that and bringing all of these stories to the fore. Because I just can't even imagine how many Jesuses we've lost because the only approved Jesuses came from the pens of basically a dozen men in the last 2000 years. Uh, there are literally, there are many people who have taught theology through the years, but if you think about like the, the, the top 10 or the, or the big dozen, almost everybody's going to come up with the same list because there literally are only a handful of people that are this sort of corpus of authority and everybody else outside of those dozen people um, are not really considered to be real theologians unless they engage those dozen men. And I think that that is a failure on the part of the church. And so I'm, I'll, I'll go right there and say that out loud. And um, churches always ask me, what do you want, what do we have to do to move forward? And my, my answer is, listen to all the people you've never listened to before. There's um, the author, of which I totally forget, and when I was an undergrad, read P Pious and Profane. The, the history of the, of the church, I should say, is the history of the pious and the profane. Wow. About one you could never have the other in terms of what we know to be institutionalized religion or the church today. And you, you have this very wonderful comment on page 98 that uh, we need a prism of stories to begin to understand uh, what we're calling the cross and, and a lifetime of experiences. And I was going to say, this runs counter to the Protestant, right? The Lutheran, Luther, the declaration of, no, you just have to have this. You just need to do that. And it's all done. Mm -hmm. and, um, that kind of um, in, in its own way, institutionalizes the things that Luther was criticizing, you know, uh, 1500 years of Catholic institution. I'm reminded of one of our speakers we had earlier, um, uh, Philip uh, Newell, who and he talked about cult of Christianity as this weaving, yeah. uncontrolled kind of like nature, right? Nature doesn't have straight lines. And he kept using this reference point the straight lines of empire. Constantine and the Rome introduced the straight lines of empire into an expression and experience that 
can't, when you do that, like you start cutting off limbs, right? That's, that's what you're doing. You're preventing the uh, organic process of growth of, uh, you know, life in many ways. Um, so uh, you have this theme of authority in your book and, and, you know, you keep touching on it. And I kind of was wondering if th this is the question, you know, can a movement like Jesus's survive long-term without institution, without structure? And where is that, you know, at what point, you know, we're, you and I and a couple of us agree like, okay, here's what we believe. And then someone says, you know, I think we should be able to do this, whatever that is. And we're, we're like, well, does that really follow? And they believe it does. And, you know, the sort of, okay, we can't be together. Like, where is that? Is there a balance? And if there's no balance, then it means there has to be separation, right? Um, so how do, you, how do you see that as a challenge and maybe even a possible solution? Yeah, this is a, I think this is kind of an interesting place to end, you know, as we're moving towards the last couple of remarks here, is that um, you know, the question of authority is a really important question. And I do raise it in any number of places in the book because it's very clear that I'm constantly chafing against authority um, in this book. And maybe that's because I'm a late uh, end of the line baby boomer. Um, maybe it's because I'm a woman and women who wind up in certain kinds of positions always do wind up chafing against authority. Ask Teresa of Avila or uh, Hildegard of Bingen about that. Um, and, you know, so I have very ambivalent ideas about authority. I've always been on the short end of authorities kinds of rules and sticks. Um, but at the same time, I'm not going to say that I that they they're necessarily needed. What I would say is it's what we have. It's impossible to tell the story of Christianity without the story of these institutions, and without the story without the straight line story that John Philip uh, talks about. Yet my imagination as a writer is what else was possible, and what else might be done, because. Stanley Hauerwas, who, I, who was at Duke as a professor when I was a student there, I'll never forget him one time in a lecture saying, and I don't know if it was in public or if it was just at the graduate school, but he said, long after Christianity is dead and gone, the United Methodist Church will still exist. And you know, that is like the truest thing ever, is that um, institutions, especially big global institutions with incredible wealth just last, you know? And so when you talk about religious movements and the, you know, institutions often swat those things off like they're just ephemera, you know? And, and, and those institutions go on and long after Christianity is dead and gone, the United Methodist Church will still be with us. Um, and you can say that for any of them. And so, so I am not worried about the institutional life of Christianity. It is just going to be there. It's going to be that straight line. It's going to be those authoritative uh, sort of claims on our lives. It's going to be all of that stuff for a really long time. You know, one church in the Episcopal Church, Trinity Wall Street, Street in New York, and I love working with them. They're great people. They're wealthier than than practically any other investor in the whole of the United States, they own so much of New York city. You know, they just have huge real estate holdings. They aren't going anywhere. Um, and so, you know, small churches might come and go, but institutional Christianity, it just keeps lumbering on through history. And so I'm going to let somebody else worry about those stories and their theology. And my concern is, what pops up at the margins? What the what? What are the weaving threads? What is the fabric of of protest, of alternative wisdom, of of deeply empowered, marginalized people? What is that all about? And that's really what I care about. And so, those are the I. What it probably means is I'll be forgotten after I go. And that's okay, because if I gave a small percentage 
of people, voice, and joy who might not otherwise know it. Um, I would rather do that than secure the future of an institution. And that's, that's my vocation. And that is certainly a choice that I have made. And that's what it is. No excuses, no regrets. There are so many things we could be talking about in your book. And there's just, I mean, we, we could do a blog on this book <laughs> or a podcast. I'm not kidding, like a serial series on it. And um, my biggest worry even now is we only just scratched the surface, which is fine uh, because there has to be a limit. And you buy the book. Uh, yeah, we, that's right. <laughs> uh, I get it. And um, so, uh, Bill, would you like to? Yeah, I just uh, want to thank you, Diana, for a wonderful, enlightening, engaging, and experiential experience uh, here this morning. Um, I remember our first trip when we went down to uh, January Adventure, it was you and Marcus Borg. Mm -hmm. So you were part of that first experience and how far you've come. <laughs> it's, uh, it's really, and I remember at Sandy Springs Christian Church and when you were with us before. Oh, my. Time, I mean, so we've got a long history. Uh, it's really been fun watching your grow. And uh, I think you've brought along some of us with you. So thank you very much for a very enlightening program. Oh, well, Bill, I remember our wonderful drive to the Atlanta airport one year together. And that was that whole car trip was just an experience in and of itself. <laughs> yeah. So they said. <laughs> And thank you. That's very kind. You know, sometimes people think that writers, you know, oh, I've heard her. It's so funny. Sometimes people will say that to me. They'll say, oh, well, you know, we'd have you back at our church, but our people have heard you before. And my answer is always, oh, no, you haven't. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do a testimony to that. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Life is about change and it's about that journey. And it's I cool. know that the people at Mountaintop, you have a little bit of an older audience. You all know that. Oh, but you know what's nice? No about secret to you. Our audience <laughs> grows along with you. Oh. Um, and so I, I would venture to say that there's nobody who's been participating in mountaintop lectures for 10 years who holds the same view That's of right. the world and life and religion uh, that they did 10 years ago. Yay. Thank That's you. applause to you all. <laughs> well, uh, I do want to be sure that we get the uh, survey of results too. Brandon. <laughs> yep they're ready yep. Okay. uh so i guess are you pulling the plug here now michael yeah i guess so so without i mean with and this is going to get kind of messy but anyway thank you everybody for attending we really appreciate it mount top lectures this survey is important for us uh in how we plan and chart out the pre uh, sort of post-covid world uh with uh it's never going away in some ways. And, and this is a, we're trying to experiment with different mediums to be able to continue to do these kinds of uh, events. So it really helps us that if you could uh, do that survey. And if you didn't, you're welcome to send us an email, I'm just going to say, and say uh, what you thought of it. Maybe we might send you a follow up or something like that. So I guess that's it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a wonderful weekend and stay safe and healthy, okay? Brandon? Are we on, Brandon? <laughs> I guess we still are. Uh, can you pop that survey up? I just, I love these surveys. They're instantaneous and they accumulate yes. everything. All right, let's see. Look at this, 43% have never attended uh, a lecture of Mountaintop. Wow, and, that's and this, I thought I'd still be able, I minimized my poll, my poll because I couldn't, you know, I was doing it and I thought I could bring it back, but I guess I, I couldn't, so. Here we're looking at 30% uh, have been a lifetime or annual sponsor. Did you enjoy today's program of Diana Butler Bass? 99%. Uh, did you find today's presentation beneficial or helpful in your 